This episode is brought to you by Munton's Malts, a company that is passionate about providing premium malts to brewers worldwide. For over a century, Munton's has been a leading supplier of brewing and distilling malts, offering the finest British malted barley on the market. You can experience the difference Munton's offers by joining a recipe receiving tier of our Trub Club because every kit that ships out now includes premium Munton's malt. You know, we've known the Munton's crew for a long time, and I can tell you, friend, you're going to love brewing with their grains. Ask your local supply shop to carry Munton's malts, or homebrewers can join our Trub Club at homebrewhappyhour.com forward slash club, be a part of the community, and come brew with us. Thank you, Muntons, for supporting our efforts and homebrewers worldwide. Today's show is brought to you by HopsDirect.com. Grown in the esteemed Yakima Valley on the Pewterball family farm, HopsDirect.com offers the widest variety of hops available online at incredibly competitive pricing. It's simple. They grow hops, they sell hops, and they ship hops straight from their family-owned farm to your doorstep. Producing the highest quality hops is HopsDirect.com's passion, and they're proud to be an independent grower in the craft beer industry. Go to HopsDirect.com right now and get what you need to make your brew day better. That's HopsDirect.com. Today's show is brought to you by Imperial Yeast. You hear us gushing over Imperial Yeast all the time, and that's because their yeast performs for us in every batch that we brew. Imperial Yeast is adored by commercial breweries and home brewers alike. Their pitch right pouches are jam-packed with over 200 billion fresh yeast cells guaranteed to deliver flawless, fast fermentations every time. Imperial yeast strains are grown by a team of pro brewers and home brewers who live to help other brewers learn more and ferment better. Join any recipe receiving tier of our Trub Club and get a free upgrade to premium Imperial yeast with every recipe kit that ships out to you. Learn more at homebrewhappyhour.com forward slash club and come brew with us. Entertaining shows with content that spreads information and sparks discourse throughout the community. This is the Pearl Media Network. Shelf life for crushed grains, transferring hazy beer from my fermenter, and letting a batch stay in the fermenter for two weeks. This is Homebrew Happy Hour, episode 386. Well, hello and welcome back to another episode of the Homebrew Happy Hour. This is the show where we supply the answers to your homebrewing questions and discuss all things related to craft beer. And if you, my friend, have a question you'd like to us to discuss on a future episode... Me? Not you, my other friends, my real friends. Oh, there oh. at YouTube, if if you or listening, if you have a question you'd like for us to discuss on a future episode, you could go to homebrewhappyhour.com, or even better, you could go and text or call three two five three zero five six one zero seven. Leave a voicemail. If I use that on a future episode, you get yourself a twenty five dollar gift card to kegconnection.com. Joining me is the president and chief keg washer of kegconnection.com, Mr. Todd Burns. James is on vacation. He he had said, hey, I'll call in or whatever. I didn't bug him. Uh, so, James, if you're watching this after the fact, we miss you. But I did not like you. I'm, I'm on vacation next week. We recorded Todd and I uh, filmed some stuff with Jonathan Marut, the 2024 Kolsch Cup grand champion. And then Jonathan was nice enough to shoot some other YouTube content for our channel that's coming out very soon. The first video will be this Saturday. Actually, we only did film one extra. The only video will be this Saturday. But either way. Uh, so James has been out of town, uh, hopefully really enjoying his vacation. And I don't even know if he watches the show when he's not on it, but just telling you, James, we missed you, but I did not want to bug you because when I'm at the beach next week, I'm blocking Todd's number. I'm blocking uh, the office line. You know, you get, you get your vacation time. You should have your vacation time and enjoy it. Anyways. One nice thing about James is he gets all his, he gets kind of everything in order before he leaves. Yeah, absolutely. I will say this. If you're watching at youtube.com forward slash homebrew happy hour, you might notice this nice camera. I'm lucky, Todd, you didn't break it. I thought you might have messed up the motor when we were filming with Jonathan uh, on the gimbal. And you didn't. Uh, because I, was, I picked it up and turned it around. It was on auto track, you're, though. It was on auto. No, because look, if I, I'm putting on auto track right now on my face. 
And I so, bet you that I could pick it up on auto track and turn it around 20 times and not break it. I don't think that's true. Uh, I'll bet you five bucks. No, because I don't want to test it. Because it, no, because here's the thing. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna give some behind the scenes stuff. It was it's a shtick. Like oh yeah, I spend all Todd's money. You know this was mine. I bought this with my money. And then I'll replace it. <laughs> no, I don't want a replacement. <laughs> Yeah, you just, yeah, okay. You don't sound very confident. In, in, in. I'm never confident when money's on the line. You know that. Like, you you know better. Anyway. I'll pay the five bucks and replace it if it breaks. <laughs> okay, okay. Now we're getting closer. I've that's heard, what I said. Oh, I mean, that's what I'm saying. No, yeah. you're right. You're right. You're right. My bad. I, it wasn't just like, yeah, I paid you $5. <laughs> you won the bet, and then I have a broken <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, we, we are jumping ahead. I'm jumping ahead of ourselves because Jonathan's episode publishes when I'm out of town. But how fun was that when that was a blast getting the it was i was kind of uh i had to go out of town so i was trying to a little rushed but uh, it was fun yeah no we had it we, it was over an hour i mean it was a good episode uh yeah, we, yeah. we talked to him about his recipe formulation he's a very big competitive brewer and so i think it's good a lot of our audience is is uh either they humor they've been brewing a very long time and they just humor us and they like our personalities they or it's new people who are really getting a lot of uh zeal for the hobby and this or that and part of that zeal especially when you start brewing i think is like i want to see how my beer stats against other people so jonathan had a very cool perspective in regards to how to maybe mentally prepare and literally prepare your recipes and that kind of stuff for competitions. I liked it. Check it out next week. And again, I'll be out of town. So if you do, normally I'm on the ball when you text 325-305-6107 for the show or even for customer service. It's kind of turned into a customer service hotline, Todd, which I'm okay with because I've been able to help customers get their orders done or, or order support or all that. But if I'm not answering that hotline next week it, until like late at night when I'm already kind of buzzed from the cigars and drunk from the booze, my bad. My apologies. But anyways, um, I'm not getting drunk or buzzed at the beach. I was just kidding. But um, we do have some small talk before we get into this week's show. If um, let's see, if you are a member of Patreon.com forward slash homebrew happy hour, the Trub Club at a recipe receiving tier. I'm so pumped. I'm so excited because this month, boom, it's a Dusseldorf Alch dot alt beer. I, oh, I love this recipe. It's so good. This is actually one James came up with, and I believe he came up, he um, had modified it after one of the times we had Horst Dornbush on the show, which I should make a whole banner for Horst because Horst will be on the show the week of July 17th. You have that in your calendar, Todd? Did you put it there? Uh, I, I have your calendar. Too. Okay. I mean, is it show? I'm just saying, is the date showing? You, I mean, it, you have stuff. Yeah, up. of course. My, okay. What day is it that, that he's on the show? It is the 17th. 17th. All right. So that's a Wednesday, I think. So that week, July 18th, which is, should be the Thursday is when that episode appears, which is perfect because everyone will have already received their Dusseldorf Alch dot alt beer and you'll be happily brewing it by then, hopefully, or You'll just be getting to brewing it. So we'll probably bring that up with him, which is a great time now to bring up that Alt Pokal 2024, the Alt Beer World Championship. Yes, it is the World Championship. I have declared it is October 24th through the 26th. And registration is live right now at altpokal.com. That's A L T P O K A L dot com. You can go register right now. So you I have it the 24th through the 25th. Oh, well, it's no, it's a three day thing. Okay. So you're going back. Cause I think it, when you, when I put this in, you were going to do it in two days. We're, we're going back to three days. Oh yeah. I, I think with the amount of time we're giving people a heads up right now that we'll get, we'll, we did two days for the last Kolsch cup because we had people drop out and we could manage it between the four judges in two days. I don't know if we can do 50 entries in two days. You think we could safely? I don't know. It's don't up to you. So. I mean, you're the one that's staying through Saturday, so that's fine. With yeah. Me. Well, I, yeah. I, I live there, listen, so it's easy for me. <laughs> and listen, my wife doesn't watch the show. And even when she does, or even, she already knows this. I, believe it or not, I like the ranch. I like being up there. So yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's okay. But anyways, the alt pull call, we're giving y'all plenty of time. Even if you're not in the Trub Club and not getting this recipe, there's a lot of resources to learn how to brew an alt beer. Or maybe you've been brewing alt at home. Maybe you're a longtime listener, viewer of the show and you're like, I want to see how mine stacks up. Well, we are hosting the Alt Beer World Championship. And I bet Horst has some issues with me calling it the Alt Beer World Championship, but who cares? 
we're Americans. We do whatever we want and we take over and you'll like it or you won't. But anyways, that is all live at altpokal.com. And again, if you want to get the delicious Altstadt Alt beer shipped to you at the end of this month, go to patreon.com forward slash homebrew happy hour and join a recipe receiving tier. Thank you to our sponsors, Muntins Malt, Hopsterat.com, and of course, Imperial Yeast for always providing the most premium ingredients that go into these curated recipe kits. So without them, we could not do this. And without y'all at home supporting us through Patreon, we could not do this. So thank you so much. This is also the time of the show where I'm supposed to remind y'all, if you're watching at YouTube.com forward slash Homebrew Happy Hour, smash the like button, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell notification. More importantly, even if you don't do any of those other things, whatever, hurts my feelings. But comment, even if you're like, Josh, the camera makes you look even uglier. Okay, that helps the algorithm, I'm told. Maybe not the ugly part. I don't know. But comments overall, I'm told, help the algorithm. So, Todd, you use YouTube and you've never commented on any episode. You know how much that hurts? You're not You're not even help, trying to help out the cause. Um, I don't. I don't think I watch episodes on YouTube. Oh, every time I go to the barn and I pull up your YouTube, it's suggested at least. You just ignore the YouTube <laughs> suggestions to watch Homebrew Happy Hour. You're like, I was on it. I was I was there. I was there. I probably wouldn't watch it either <laughs> if I wasn't editing it. But anyways, that's all the small talk that I have. Basically, I always say record time, and no, it's about the same amount every time. So I'm going to stop doing that. But anyways, we got a great show. No listener feedback, but we got a couple of voicemails and a text message. So our first question of the week is a voicemail. It's our buddy Dave from Kansas City. Hey guys, I this is Dave from uh, Kansas City. I'm just giving you guys a shout to talk a little bit about uh, grains and when's the most optimal time to use them after they've been crushed. So my dilemma is I uh, I've gotten busy over the last couple weeks and I had gone to the homebrew supply store local to me and had some grains crushed. And I've just been kind of holding on to them, and I haven't been brewing because I've been too busy to get to it. And I just wanted to know your thoughts on about how long grains are good for, um, just in, let's say, a plastic bag from the supply shop. It's it's sealed with a twist tie, so about as much air is getting to it as what you get in a loaf of bread that's been sitting out for a week. But I'm about three weeks past since it's been ground uh, or milled, double milled. So uh, I want to get your thoughts on how long do you think that stuff's good for? Is there a certain amount of time that you should try to be shooting for between when you when you mill and when you actually brew? And how long is too long? And what kind of things come and happen to your beer when you use grain that may have been exposed to some oxygen after it's been milled and it's sat around? Is it going to go stale? Is it going to bring in some off flavors? Just thought I'd get your opinion. Thanks, guys. Have a great day. Dave, thank you so much for submitting the question. Now, Todd, um, I know like the general answer in regards to like, if you know it's going to be a while, you could always throw it in the freezer and that significantly adds some some length in regards to shelf life. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, I think freezing it would certainly help. Uh, I mean, that's if, if I got grain and and I wasn't going to brew it for a while, I'd, I'd seal it really well and put it in the freezer and then i have a vacuum sealer i'd probably oh, yeah. vacuum seal it because i'm i'm nerdy like that well that's not nerdy that's practical nerdy and then, uh, like james has a bag of grain that he i don't know why he has it in his office but it's been in there for at least a month now something that we i don't remember what the situation was you you it was for you and you didn't brew it or no said, it was it, when so. you um no you were gonna ship me a kit and then I think yeah. he did it instead, or, or I don't oh, forgot, no, but no. something got so anyway, bad. It's yeah, sitting anyway. there. He'll brew it eventually. And I, I don't, I never really have, I don't, I don't think that it's something you have to use immediately. I mean, we have listeners that have gotten recipes and they tell us all the time, oh, I'm way behind. I haven't brewed this. And, you know, I've, I've got three months worth of recipes to brew. 
And when they brew them, they, they seem to, to come out fine. I mean, I, I think if you left it out in your garage and it was 100 degrees, it would be a different story. But. When I was going to say that, I was going to bring that up. Uh, I think the longest I've had milled grains, I brought them home for a recipe kit that uh, maybe it was the January. I don't remember if my dad and I did the Kolsch in January or February. I think it was January. That Those grains were out in my garage. But it was a, it was cooler months, but I milled them like right after Thanksgiving and then we never brewed in December, and then we brewed in, in January. So let's say four and a half weeks or so. It was perfect. It was great. Uh, oh, yeah. and, and, I mean, four and a half weeks, I wouldn't think anything of. I, I mean, six months to a year, I don't know, maybe, but I think I've brewed, I've brewed it before that was milled six months before, and, and it, I, I, it was, to me, it was fine. You know, I couldn't tell a difference. Yeah, I um, I, I was gonna say I think if but I, but I stored the grain well. Yeah. Well, well, and and I was gonna say if if I had thought and and I benefit from having a garage fridge that has a separate freezer because I don't have room in my home freezer. So this is this is speaking from a point of privilege, my friends listening at home. But I'm just admit what I'm saying is if I thought the grains were gonna be out for maybe another month, I would have thought gone. Oh, let's throw this bag into the freezer just to be safe because sitting around in my garage, like you said, I, I it, it probably uh, is not good uh, at some point in time. And and so it, is the oxygen, I mean, what's the worst case? They go stale, right? That That's the worst case of, of what yeah, we get stale. Well, you saw me yesterday when we were counting grain. Oh, I was yeah. going through grain and throwing it in my mouth and seeing what it tastes like. We, you say we as if you did much beyond operating the calculator. I, was, I, no, I said I... When we were doing it, I was running around throwing. That was part of the process. Is oh. me eating, munching on grain, and 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 I sat in the chair and wrote stuff down. I did a lot. Yeah, you <laughs> did all the heavy lifting. Of course, <laughs> we get to the office yeah. at seven thirty in the morning, and uh, I was like, "Hey, let's just knock it out while it's cool upstairs." And I forgot how much grain we had. That was a lot of lifting. It was very heavy. It was a bag after, but, but the, but the good thing is we are prepared, my friends, for a very long time for our Trub Club recipe kits, but and we have an accurate count finally. So when Todd is like, Hey, I'm going to brew this and this. And then I reply almost every time I reply, do we have enough for you? Do we have enough for you? Cause you don't care. You don't, you don't, you don't care. You know, another thing too, about our listeners is uh, you, you mentioned yesterday, I just thought about this or was it the, whenever you were here yesterday, yeah. that was just yesterday. Wow. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, you mentioned, uh, that a lot of our people, a lot of the people in the club are now milling their own grain. So of course, if they're milling their own grain, then it wouldn't be anywhere near as of a concern, right? That, that w in that you read my mind, I was going to segue into what about grains that aren't milled? Because a lot of the people in our Trub Club, are, like you said, I mean, it's at least 75%. I almost said 90, but I'm, not, I'm bad at math and, com and numbers and, and statistics and probabilities and everything. I'm bad. I'm just bad. But um, our numbers are high where people are getting it unmilled. I would think, yeah, those grains, those are the brewers, who, like you said, who are like, I like getting the monthly kits. I like what you're curating, but I can't brew it with y'all in these synchronous, like every month or whatever. A lot of them are throwing it in chest freezers. I have it on good authority or fridges. I say, and I keep saying freezers, the fridge is adequate enough. Wouldn't it be Todd? If they have room in their fridge, like just in a, the high thirties yeah. is probably good. enough. I mean, we, what is the walk in? Oh, yeah, it'd, be, it'd be fine. What, what is the walk in upstairs? What would the temperature? I have no, I, I've never looked. It's, uh, uh, I don't know, 35, 40 degrees. I don't oh, know. Oh, so exactly. it's like a, it I is like to, a fridge. It's a fridge. Oh, yeah. okay. I thought for some reason walk-ins were a little warmer than like your average fridge. I mean, it's cold in there. No, the vast majority of, uh, of, of customers that we have that serve beer, it comes out, you know, I'm talking about commercial restaurants, bars, it comes out of a walk-in. And uh, so it has to be a minimum of 38 degrees. I, I usually recommend they put it at about 36 uh, 37 because it you know goes up and down so oh good point but yeah, yeah. the vast majority walk-ins are refrigerators They're, they can get as cold as a refrigerator they can they could even uh freeze you know and um yeah I, I or ours you just have it set to not obviously i've never had that problem with ours yeah but um and i answered my own question and my thought process because we we since 
getting out of the ingredients game as a retailer and only offering it through patreon.com forward slash homebrew happy hour, we've been storing our base grains specifically in the majority of our grains that we can fit in the walk-in cooler. And it made sense because it is just healthier for the overall storage because that upstairs, you do have it air conditioned, but it can get very hot in a Texas summer up there. Yeah. And then it would be very expensive for you running the AC just for grains up there. So the walk-in has been kind of our saving grace on that. You say you use a vacuum sealer. What is the biggest amount of grains you vacuum seal? Cause I've never, I mean, I, I can't imagine you're sealing a 30 pound bag of grains or something or with vacuum sealing. Uh, no, no, you're right. No, I mean, you could. Grains, I could, man. I mean, I, it would just be very long and, um, uh, difficult to get 30 pounds in there <laughs> well that's what that's I, what I, I usually yeah. just i usually just vacuum sealed small amounts yeah well you, you usually vacuum seal when, when it comes to brewing stuff i've seen you reseal hops i'm just saying yeah. I, i've never the grain thing I, I i was just what i was going to allude to is is it worth someone investing in a vacuum sealer it's probably not right and in, in, in regards no. to just grain storage you just no. you utilize it because you've had it i have one for something so, for other I stuff use it for i use it all the time like almost Probably at least once a week or something. Yeah, mostly food, I'd imagine. Food, yeah, a lot of food. That wasn't a fat joke. That was just an observation. Of- I, I like food, Josh. <laughs> you, I like turtles, yeah. Hey, <laughs> we should show that. Let me get that. What are you getting? Oh, he took his headphones off. He can't even hear me. I love a good set. Here, here's me juggling. Uh, with, with the grains, I would also say, Dave, that, oh, here's Todd's back. For those of you who haven't seen this before i did not even recognize him i thought he was a different person uh hold on let me uh so this right here this guy i know you probably won't recognize him but the other side josh is in that photograph i'm I'm on if you're watching at youtube i'm one of i'm next to the bald guy that's ben he was bald before me yeah look at that face so go to your left a little like move the image a little more a little more, now towards the camera, now straight forward. That's me. Oh, yeah, look at that type. Oh, look yeah. at that diabetic oh, face. good. Look at that look fat at, Josh. Look. He was a fun guy. I like that guy. <laughs> diabetic. And now I'm just less fat, Josh. Um, <laughs> that was when, that was, uh, that was literally, the, uh, we launched, Did was our grand opening in the fall or the spring of 2012, uh, 2011? Oh, it was 2012. It was 2012. And I think it was like, it was like January or February of 2012. And that was literally right when I started training jujitsu. So that was the, that was peak fat Josh. Cause December of 2011 is when my doctor was like, I went in for a head cold and he's like, Hey, you're going to die from this high blood pressure and all this ah, other stuff. You're fine. I know. I know. Look at you. You're the epitome of, of men's health, but you don't have hypertension. You don't have bad cholesterol. None of that. So I went in yesterday and I always, I always get a little nervous at the doctor, but anyway, they took my pulse at one point yesterday and it was, uh, it was, uh, or blood pressure. You mean? Blood, well, they took my pulse and my blood pressure, I guess. Yeah. It was one twenty over 67. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Whatever. I'm on amlodipine and it's still like one thirty over 80. <laughs> like, 130 over 80 is great though. Yeah. It? Yeah. When you have hypertension, I guess, I don't know, but when you're medicated, it's like, should they be perfect? But they tell me I have white coat syndrome. There's an actual medical name for it. But anyways, what doesn't have white coat syndrome is grains on the shelf. Oh. There's shelf life. Um, yep. So yeah, the, we, uh, we understand the plastic bags from the supply shop. Uh, if we, if you had to put a time, uh, or, how about this? What are some best practices, assuming they don't have room in the fridge and they don't have a, another freezer? Uh, would you at least agree with me that keep it in a temperature controlled, like your home? Dark like, dark and cool place. Dark and pantry, cool. Just like you store your flour and all your other stuff. Yeah, exactly. Or, I mean, think about fl- flour is a great example. I mean, flour is just ground up wheat. And I, I, how often have you used flour that's a year old? You know, it's... Uh, I mean, I, I would, you said to give you, I mean, I would not worry at all uh, up to six months. Yep. And in fact, th- it's funny because when people reach out to us, I think you've taken these questions too. And they get our recipe kits and they're like, oh, I won't be able to brew it for like five months. That's when we tell them actually for the kits, the liquid yeast is the part of the whole thing that you're going to probably need to replace if you're right. waiting that right. long. Yeah. But like, if you're just, by, uh, Dave, I don't believe is in our club club. If he is, he'd be brand new. I don't think I know any Dave's from Kansas city, but 
If you're just talking about grain specifically, not like, I got all this stuff for the kit and I got liquid. I yeast. think he was just asking about grain. Exactly. Yeah. I know I'm giving context. It's called oh, uh, right. extrapolating. The next question. Oh, my gosh. You're I cannot wait for you to do your own show and not have me on it. It's going to be the amount of time I do small talk will be the amount I'm gonna, of time. No, I'm going to take six questions instead of three. <laughs> I'm going to take 24 questions and they're all going to be two minutes. <laughs> Anyways, Dave, or actually, if you're watching at youtube.com forward slash home for happy hour, let us know what you think below. How do you store your grains? What's the most amount of time you think that you would think uh, milled grains would be good for? Specifically, double milled. Does double milled change any of the physiological components of the grains? I'm just throwing big words out there now. Let us know in the comments below. Wow. I know. Let us know in the comments below, or you can call it in if you think it's worthy of being played on the future episode to 325 305 61 Zero seven. Have I mentioned we are desperate for voicemail questions? Like a month ago, I did another I accidental. I wonder what the psychological implications are for the grain. <laughs> I hate you sometimes. And this is a good reminder, Dave. Thank you for the question. That when you call that hotline, 325-305-6107, and I played on a future episode, your question, preferably, you'd get yourself a $25 gift card to kegconnection.com. Or... You could text that number or email Joshua at Homebrew Happy Hour and still get yourself a $15 gift card, which I think is pretty good. Like our second question of the show, our buddy John T. texted me and he wrote, Josh, Todd, James, I know hazies are not your style. Still, I brewed one. No, not true. <laughs> He's talking to me, man. He's talking no, to no, me. No, no, but he said, Todd, James, Joshua, <laughs> I don't think hazies are your style. That's not true. I love hazies. Okay. <laughs> okay. They're, majority rules, though. Uh, you're right. They're Todd style. He says, still, I brewed one. Like Josh, I use Firmzilla's, too. He uses an all-rounder. I talked to him on the phone. Uh, this is my first hazy. My gravity suggests that fermentation is done. Unlike every style I've brewed before, this beer is so hazy, I can't see where the yeast pile is. What would you do transferring a batch? You can't see a difference between beer and trub. Uh, I, I have you. When's the last time you even brewed a hazy? I mean, some uh, beers probably about a year ago. And when you brewed it, though, probably in a conical. And mm -hmm. and when you're doing that, the the principle is still the same. You're looking at your clear tubing as it's transferring. Yeah, and I mean, when it's a, even a hazy in a in a in a quarter inch or five sixteenths. I think it's five sixteenths what I use, but well, it doesn't matter. Uh, there, there, you know, it, it still looks pretty clear when you, when it's that small, uh, when you're only looking through that much of it. Right. So it, it, with, with me, it was, it was very easy to tell when I got to the yeast, cause it, it went from being a little cloudy to being cloudy. Right. So right. I, I just, I didn't experience that. When that and so that is the most straightforward answer of that. You will see the difference in the tubing. I, we're confident of that. However, mm -hmm. I would say adding, and I'm going to put this product in the show notes. We talked about it. We've been talking about it a lot lately, but they've been flying off the shelf too for good reason. I would say if you're really worried about it and you don't want to have to just stand and observe some tubing the entire time, I have been so impressed with these. I have one on my desk. Here we go. It's attached to a, a lid. You could use a floating dip tube, specifically like a filtered one like this float it that we sell at catconnection.com. You see it on the screen there. Look at this new camera. Look at that sharpness, Todd. Isn't that beautiful? It, using this, I would suspect because the, the whole marketing spiel of it is no beer left behind. Go listen to Trong. He'll tell you on his website. You can get these though at catconnection.com. But um, this really does a good job of going all the way down and then not bringing in thicker particulates into the transfer. So I am confident if you... What, what, do you what do you mean by not bringing in? I'm saying like the thickest stuff that you would normally get, because a, a normal floating dip tube, which I don't have here, is just an open hole mm -hmm. attached to a floating ball. And so anything that can fit in that hole is coming in. So you're still, you can't just set and forget a normal floating dip tube on a on a fermenter uh, on a batch that's in a fermenter because it will bring up everything that can possibly suck up where i'm saying this i am confident because i've used it it is not going to bring up as uh, even a fraction of the amount of trub that a standard um floating dip tube does you look you look you want to you want to uh, bet me five dollars um i mean i think as far as yeast, I don't think that that 
that coarse filter is going to stop yeast from coming through. Okay. Well, I'm saying though the the thicker parts of it. I'm not saying all of it. I'm saying though the thickest of the trub is not going to be able to be sucked in it like it would if I like because if because in theory, if I take this off the tubing, this is all a floating dip tube is is whatever fits into this tubing. Mm -hmm. This the, uh, what the only thing that can go through it is whatever can fit through the double filtration of this stainless steel filter system. I'm well, saying, how, how fine is that other filter on the inside? Uh, is it much finer? It, it is. Yes, I'll show you. Um, if I can, I got a fly that won't leave me alone. I don't know where my fly water is. So the filter here, the, you know, you've seen the outside, and here is now uh, the inside filter. So here's the inside filter. Mm -hmm. And then that outside for the double part, and then boom, and then your your sealing caps, which work very well, and then these little things are what the mechanism that attaches it to the floating head. But I've been very, my my pop and I have both been very impressed with the product, and uh, people have been buying them and giving me feedback and saying, "Oh my gosh, this thing is great!" And and I think the real selling point to it to get off my telemarketing or telecommercial or whatever the infomercial uh, kick right now. Is that they are? Uh, they're only like nine dollars more than a normal floating dip tube. So, to me, it's like it's worth it because they do last forever. They're stainless steel as long as you take care of them, keep them hygienic. But anyway, I, I, all that to say, you can set and forget with a solution like that, in my opinion. But like Todd said, though, it's gonna bring up stuff, and and you got to be vigilant with your eyes, uh, unless you're gonna use a float it on your serving head too, and then boom, now or any floating dip tube, and then it's gonna be drawing from the top where once it's cold crashed, all that stuff settles down. Your last pores will have the stuff in it, and that's when you'll know the keg is done. But um, I've never had a batch that was so hazy that in the fermenter, I couldn't see it. Now you normally use a stainless steel conical. Do you think even the haziest of beer you brewed that if it was a clear vessel, you still wouldn't be able to see a difference? Uh, a clear vessel. You mean like, a, like a the firm clear fermenter, like one of those big fermenters? Yeah. I'm saying if you, yeah, I, would, I can't imagine that you would have one that was so hazy that you didn't that you couldn't see where the trub was, but that's what he's saying. Is I know. Happening. Well, that's so, what I'm saying. That's I, I mean, a, I believe that you. is a thick hazy is what I'm, yeah. is what I'm getting at that, that you prior licking Ooh, your, I bet it's good. Yeah, I was going to say you're licking your lips at that. kind of. Mm, <laughs> oh, but there's chunks in it. I like chunks. In there. <laughs> <laughs> you're so disgusting. Did you see the beer? Uh, I know. So you went and had your ablation done on your back yep. and, uh, you probably haven't been to the barn since, uh, Jonathan left you that bottle of hazy for you. Oh, he did. I have to try it. He, he did. So I'll tell you a funny story. I got there for the ablation, and I could still kind of taste the hops in my mouth because I just remember, if you remember, I tasted two beers, but I didn't drink them. I just put them in yep, my mouth, yep. swished them around, or you know, had them float around in my mouth, and I spit them out because I couldn't drink or eat anything, right? But I literally, I got to the doctor's office, and I, and my first thing in my mind when I sat down was like. <sighs> <laughs> oh God, I'm going to sit here and tell this guy, no, I haven't drank or eaten anything. And he's going to be like, you smell like a boy. Like <laughs> like, and you can, you imagine the doctor when I tell him, Oh yes, sir. I, I did put some beer in my mouth, but I spit it out. <laughs> He'd be like, yeah, sure. buddy." It'd be like that, uh, deposition for Clinton, right? It would depend. That's what's right, your definition? Exactly. The definition of is, is yeah, all right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Listen, I didn't drink it. I don't it. think he would have believed. I wouldn't have believed me. You oh, know? Of that's course a, not. Of course not. <laughs> oh, sure. Yeah. That's what alcoholics say. That's what I always tell my dad. Uh, I'm throwing him under the bus. He watches this show. He's not a degenerate gambler, but he likes to play poker. And you talk to people who play cards or sports bet or whatever. And you always hear about the good times. And then oh, otherwise, it's like, oh, I did okay. I'm even. It's like, no, not all gamblers can be even, man. I don't believe y'all anymore. It's like, you know, they never say like, I'm 80,000 in the hole. Oh, like it's always like, yeah, I'm either doing really good or yeah, it's about a wash. It's, it's, it's about a wash, you know, no big deal. Anyways, John T. Um, I like, like Todd said, I think if you're not wanting to spend extra money, you want to utilize everything you already have. Uh, you're gonna see the difference, dude. You're gonna, you'll see like, oh my God, it, it was hazy the whole time through and it now is getting thick. Uh, you'll, you'll see and you'll know. And another way too, though, Todd, uh, that I didn't consider, you could always, 
assuming you have a scale or something, you, 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 a lot of people will put their empty keg on a scale and an average keg is I'm rounding here. So don't, don't get after me, Todd. It's about 10 pounds. And then a full keg, if you can get five gallons into it is going to be about 40 pounds. And so your scale, as you're seeing it, if you're transferring from the firmzilla or whatever, and you're getting five gallons into that keg, once your keg gets to like 48, 49, then you could be on that scale. That is, then you could be hyper vigilant about, oh, making sure I'm not getting anything from the bottom, bottom, bottom coming in. If you really can't see visually the difference um, that I mean, that that's like that would be my plan B in regards to how do I ensure I'm not pulling up too much from the bottom? Well, at some point, you're going to hit volume anyways, assuming you're you have enough beer in the fermenter to fill up a five gallon keg. Sometimes my pop and I only yield 10, you know, we're trying to go for 10 usable gallons and oh no, we only really got nine and a half. And so, you know, the first keg could be full, but the second keg's not yada, yada, yada. There's obviously a lot of factors like there is with every question we ever take, but that's an idea for you. And I welcome y'all's ideas. If you're watching at youtube.com forward slash homebrew happier in the comments below or call or email or whatever you want to do to get us your feedback. Uh, would you, you have anything else to add before I move us along? Nope. Perfect. John T., thank you so much for submitting that question. A final reminder, my friends, you can text it like him to 325-305-6107 and get yourself a $15 gift card and be like, that's good. I don't like hearing my voice on air. Da, da, da. Even better, you can call it into 325-305-6107 and get yourself $10 more. That's a $25 gift card at catconnection.com just for us to make fun of, pardon me, to participate in hearing your voice. And our last question of the show, it is a voicemail. It's our buddy Logan from Waco. Hey, guys. Um, did my second brew the other day. Um, and there was a lot of firsts. And I was trying to do the uh, Kolsch Nels recipe. Um, didn't come out quite the way I wanted to, number-wise, but we'll see in a couple of weeks how it tastes. Um, my first question, I didn't have my hot bag, so I kind of stirred to try to whirlpool, and I noticed that I got a lot more hot pellet debris than anticipated or probably should have. Um, I'm probably going to try to let this fermentation go the full two weeks, even though I know I don't need it. Um, it's already done, I believe, um, but I haven't checked it. I'm just going to let it ride, leave it alone. Should I go ahead and take it off sooner and bottle it? I know kegs are better, but should I bottle it now to get it off of the extra hops, or is the hops already done its damage and um, it'll be okay? It was only a 60-minute. And so I'm sure most of it boiled off anyways. And so it being in the bucket probably didn't matter. Um, I guess all that to say, should I go ahead and take it off early or should I leave it in the bucket um, for another week or so? All right. Thanks. Um, this is Logan from Waco, Texas. And uh, nice shooting, Josh. I think you've got a uh, real career potential in shooting flies. Thank you, guys. You didn't watch our brew day live, Todd. Um, we, no. I don't know how the flies are where you're at, but in down Austin area, my parents' property here in San Marcos too, the fl house flies in the yard. Oh my gosh, mm -hmm. it is it's terrible. So my dad and I both had. You have the bug assault gun too somewhere. I, I, I want to get the bigger one. It's for so force flies that are biting me at the pool. <laughs> so okay, yeah. Before we answer Logan's question, please, I would find one and get one because I hate the horse flies biting me on my bald head up at the pool. Oh, they have them. They're just expensive. They're like a hundred dollars. Oh, never mind. Okay, never mind. Never mind. I don't want that. I don't want it that bad. Maybe home. But I happen. keep looking at them. I I wanted the whole the whole time we were doing the live stream. I was I, I wish I would have tagged Bug Assault to be like, hey, sponsor us. We would love. <laughs> and by sponsor, I mean just send us some horsefly guns so right. we can take because they hurt. First time I've ever been bitten by a horsefly in my life was at your pool last summer, and uh, just sitting there in the hot really? tub in your life. You live. You live the most. Cushy life, if anybody ever in your entire life you've never been bitten by a horse fly. My life is pretty good, man. What can wow. I say? My That's life amazing. is pretty good. Yeah, maybe my maid. I've been I've been bit a thousand times by <laughs> horse flies in my life. Maybe I'll ask my my house servants if they've ever been bitten. You know, I'll just see if. <laughs> 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 By that I mean, my I forgot. I already forgot what Logan's question was. Now. <laughs> he brewed the Kolsch. He wasn't that. He wasn't excited about the numbers. But his first question was about the hops. He didn't have a hop bag. Addressing that first, I haven't used a hop bag 
in the boil kettle in a very, very, very long time. And I've never had any issues with it. And and even spoiler, if y'all watch us at youtube.com forward slash homebrew happy hour for every month's brew day live, you'll notice too, I've also, my dad and I don't whirlpool and we haven't had any issues either. Um, uh, you know, he, he, well, we, well, I mean, well, you tell me, okay. Elaborate on the, eh. Well, you brought me a keg of beer the other day that was really, really cloudy. That was a few weeks ago, and that was uh, that was also that I transferred bad. Like that was the one that I didn't depressure my pre- my tra- my clothes transferring was not proper, like it has been now the last two batches because that one was all basically foam and it was drawing from the bottom. It was bad news bears and it was agitated. Yeah, th- that alt beer it did clear up. Hey, and Jonathan did he agreed with me? Well, th- okay. Yeah, it cleared up because, because you filtered, filtered it. it. No, I know, yeah. but but I'm saying um, he agreed with me that it is a good beer. It's not an alt beer, but it's a great amber ale. It did. Yeah, it is good. At the end I of the, like it. At the end of the day, it worked out. But what I'm saying is, though, uh, these are all details that you can pay attention to and will will be noticeable in the final result. But I'm saying you don't have to fret over it. Specifically in in loading situation, hop particulates making it into your fermenter. It's totally normal. You're going to have a big old trub cake yeast yeah. and particulates and all that. They're going to be at the bottom uh, and near the bottom when you're done. And if you're using a bucket, you're probably using an auto siphon, you know, sucking it to, to get to either secondary and or the keg, which if you have the time load in, in, instead of, in my opinion, instead of letting it sit for two full weeks, Todd, I would transfer to secondary and use that time in the cold conditioning. That's what I would suggest. Yeah, I mean, what what was he unhappy about with the numbers? Oh well, he didn't he didn't go into it here, but he um I don't have the context of that except that he did message me separately, and I think he actually posted on a few Facebook groups I'm a part of just why his numbers were just off. Um, I don't remember the full details. You mean like his his, his number gravity. wasn't as low as he wanted it? Correct. To be. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I mean, so that I mean, that's real important in answering the question because if his numbers weren't high enough. And he needs to get them lower than he he may need to leave it in the fermenter longer and let it ferment. Oh well, in the well, in the I didn't the numbers thing was about the the hot side of the day. Not it wasn't about fermentation. For it was about starting gravity that he had missed his numbers on starting gravity. Hmm. Oh, he, okay. So they must have been too low. Probably, probably. Yeah. But but you right. But we our question for him on this week is just on the cold side or or on the post hot side it's on the fermentation side um obviously even with the bucket you can use a thief you can use a lot of things to get your reading and if you're at 10 10 10 9 uh or or even some people like todd will go down to 10 6 on their kolsch yeah <laughs> wait if you're if you're past if you're 10 10 or 10 9 or whatever uh it fermentation is done and instead of saying ah, i might as well just let it sit for a couple of weeks for the sake of the hops dropping i think a better practice would be once it's done, transfer it to secondary and or the keg that you could call secondary and throw it in, into a fridge and let it sit. Two weeks in the fridge, cold conditioning is better than two weeks in the bucket uh, post-fermentation. Would you agree? No, absolutely. Well, also, it could go a lot lower. I mean, the one that I pulled the other day, and it was at, it was already at 6, uh, 1.06, it was uh, was still bubbling. So if I would have left it in a couple more days, it I don't know where it would have gone to. Well, <laughs> it would have gone to water. No, what I mean realistically, what could it have gone to? I mean, you did ten cents is low. That mm-hmm. that 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 was a lot of fermentation going on. What do you think realistically it could have gotten down to? I mean, I've had a drop of four, below five. Really? Uh huh. Well, and like. Some certain things Accidentally. like mead, they drop oh, all, mead. The way to zero, all the way to zero, no, basically. So. Right, but you, your mead was also uh, 18-month endeavor or 12-month? Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, it was uh, a, 12 months. Yeah. yeah, we're talking about you You're you used Dieter in this last batch, mm-hmm. and you, I don't think you even let it ferment for more than five days. No, it, I, it wasn't. It was, it was still bubbling a lot the day before, so I said, I'm not even going to check it. I know it's not that low. And then when I checked it the next day, it was still I could still see bubbles coming up, and it was at six. So and and I say, and I, I would use an extremely accurate 
hydrometer. So I, I use that really big one I have that has big numbers on it. And yeah. it's it's the most accurate hydrometer I have. Some context of Logan I, I did miss, and, and this might change the answer a little. He doesn't keg yet. He just bottles. Would you, if let's say he doesn't have a carboy, would you be opposed to using your primary bucket as putting it into a fridge to cold condition in that or is cold conditioning part of the bottling process no 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 we're going to bottle put the priming sugar and then throw it in the fridge and now it's bottle conditioning what what would you say if let's assume he does not have a, another vessel for secondary fermentation mm. yeah that's hard i mean <laughs> you definitely could do it in the bottles and it, and it would clear it would clear up in the bottles but you just have to be careful when you pour it because you're going to have all that sediment on the bottom. So you, you got to, you know, anybody that bottles knows that you're going to have some sediment, but he's going to have the sediment from the secondary ferment, uh, you know, the car, you put in the carby, uh, the, the sugar for it, to the carb, primary sugar, yeah. which is really just another fermentation. Yeah. Right. Yep. And, uh, and, and you, so you get the stuff that falls down from that. You're always going to get that. It's inevitable. But he's going to have double. He's going to have what is left in, in the beer that hadn't clarified yet, plus uh, what what happens from the priming sugars. Yeah, so. part of what Jonathan told us is that he won't bottle condition certain styles anymore because he did bottle condition the Kolsch one year. And it was mm -hmm. like, oh, yeah, duh. Like I, it's, It had stuff in it. Like you, you can't – it's hard to get around that when you are going straight from fermentator – or fermentator – fermenter into bottles. I mean, if you have it in a really cold fridge, it's quite easy to to just pour it carefully and and leave all that stuff in the very bottom of the bottle. You're going to lose a little beer, though. Yeah, and uh, but I will also address to you know he I know he was just speaking you know what commonly used phrases, but there's no damage done from having the hops outside of a bag. I just wanted to get that out of the way. Uh, bags are not. I mean, I would say but most people don't use a bag, right? Well, exactly. And I think a lot of people in my anecdotal experience, I'm not the expert on the. Actually, you know what? I'm the foremost expert on uh, hop bags and protocols for using hops in brew days. Let me get that out of the way. Uh, yeah. Hop spiders are a lot more common than hop bags in my observation. A lot of people do have. Uh, I you I know you don't use it, but listen, hear me out. A lot of people do choose to use those because it's a, it's it's basically like the float its uh, filtration that you know. But it's it, imagine this much bigger hanging off uh, inside your kettle, and then yeah, you, I've got one. I've got a spider. Oh, I didn't know. I that. just didn't realize that many people used them. I think I think they're very popular. But again, huh. ba based off the community I talked to, are so so. I mean, and I think it's important to note that you know most people don't use hot bags. Obviously, when they're when they're brewing, but a lot of people end up using a spider or a hop bag when they're doing dry hopping. Oh, that too, of course, yeah. Hop bonds, hop spiders, yeah. Bags, and you, and you, that is a good point to bring up because you're right. My, I'm about to keg. Uh, the, this is going to be kind of our secondary because these aren't going to be the serving kegs. But that mosaic smash that we just we're killing all the flies that brew day. I'm about to keg them later today, and uh, I will be using bagged hops in those sanitized bags and then throw the hops in there, purge the kegs, all that good stuff, because I don't want, I want a better chance at not bringing over hot particulates. Even though I'll be using floatits, I want the best chance possible to, when I'm transferring to our serving kegs, not bring all that junk over. My dad and I one time did a homebrew supply recipe called Hop Fellas, and Joe Ermas, love him, God bless him, and he, he loves hops, and um, when, when it came time to dry hop, he was like, yeah, just throw them in. You just throw them in. It doesn't matter. You just throw them in the keg. It'll be perfect. My dad and I were picking hot particulates from our teeth the first two gallons of that keg. It, we didn't have a floating dip tube. It, it, we did have to pull the dip tube out a bunch. It was a pain in the butt. So I would say, don't dry hop directly into the keg, my friends. If Use a bag. You use something that will, or or have a floating dip tube, or cut the bottom of your dip tube there, but don't use a standard old keg and dry hop directly in there. But anyways, um, for a Kolsch, yeah, I mean, if he was doing our recipe, it was one ounce of holler tile. He's right about a lot of it probably boiling off uh, in regards to, it's not going to bring over, Kolsch's are not known to bring over a lot of hot particulates into your um, fermenter. So I wouldn't think too much of it. That's the best case scenario. You brewed a delicious Kolsch and you don't got to worry about so many hops where Todd would say, 
the more hops, the merrier. Not for a Kolsch, but I'm just saying you like that style. You like styles that do it. But right, I, I think exactly. that basically covers it. Well, oh, how about this? Two wheats. How long is too long for a batch to be in, in primary before you start getting worried about the yeast now that it's sitting there might bring some off flavors? Is two wheats pushing it or is that still in the safe? Like, yeah, you could be in. Yeah, you should be fine with two weeks. I mean, I don't. And the primary fermenter, I mean, yeah, I, I mean, I, I mean, you're asking the wrong person. I, I mean, I leave, I leave mine in the primary fermenter for two, three months sometimes, but not at the same temperature the whole time. No, the, he, no. he's in a bucket. This is uh, this is presumably at the same temp for the entire two weeks. You would still, mm-hmm. two, yeah, I think you're, I think two, you're fine with two weeks. I would say so too. In the old, I, I, I mean, I would, I, I'm almost never leave it at the same temperature that long because it. The, the final gravity will just get too low at some point. Oh, because it's just still chugging and chugging and chugging. Yeah. And that would depend on your yeast health and all that, too, right, more right. importantly. But I just always – I haven't really been a serious home brewer except after we've already had a relationship with Imperial as retailers before they sponsored us. So I've been spoiled by these three- to five-day fermentation. When you were brewing – Back in the olden days, back like fire was invented, the wheel. Yeah, two weeks wasn't unusual in okay. a lot of batches. Yeah. Okay, that's why I was wondering because uh, I, I traveled every week, so I didn't have much of a choice. You know, I would, if I brewed something and it wasn't ready before I left for my trip, it was going to be in there for another four days or or even more. And the, and and nothing was ever like, oh God, us oh, astringent or anything. I mean, you it was still good beer. Yeah. Perfect. So Logan from Waco, thank you so much for submitting the question. The last reminder, guys, when you call our hotline 325-305-6107 and leave a question like Logan did that I will play on a future episode. And spoiler, again, we we have like maybe 10 in the hole and I haven't listened to them all. So if they're 10 unique ones, hey, we're set for a few more weeks. But if they're not 10 unique ones, I am dying. So leave a voicemail. And when I play it, get yourself a $25 gift card to kegconnection.com. Boss man, that is all I have for this week. I greatly appreciate your time, um, and I'm going to be on vacation next week, so don't bother me. Okay, so we, we're doing the. I'm going to do the podcast without you. How to? You have to show me how to produce it. Though. <laughs> Jonathan Marut's episodes next week to avoid that. I told you, whenever you and James are ready, I will be the silent producer, and y'all will run the show. I suggested to Jonathan because we were talking about it yesterday. We should do that for the April Fool's episode next year. That should be. Oh yeah. So James and I are going to do an episode. And and you and you're just going to be in the background. We're going to answer ten questions. I'm going to take my whole camera off the screen. I will be running the show for you, like yeah. because you don't. I don't expect you to learn how to run the the stream. No, deck I'd like and... to learn how to run the show. What if I ever need to get rid of you? I mean... <laughs> That's no, no. You know. <laughs> I, oh, wait, did I just say that out loud? I, hey, listen, I've been, you know, I love AI. And someone was like, oh, well, when's AI going to replace, be able to replace you? And I was like, oh, once it develops a little bit of wit and a personality. And then. Yeah, they, yeah, it's got to get that wit. But yeah. they showed me chat GPT 4.0. Oh, my God, I'm done. I'm screwed. This the new <laughs> chat, I'm done, dude. The second you realize that chat, the newest version of chat GPT can replace me, it, it can. I'm done. Uh, I'm updating my LinkedIn. Uh, which, when I have no skills. I have no usable skills. This is, yeah. uh, <laughs> but anyways, yeah. I appreciate it. I'll talk to you later. All right. Thanks. Take care. And Bye-bye. that will do it for this episode of the Homebrew Happy Hour. If you have a question you'd like us to discuss on a future episode, you could go to homebrewhappyhour.com and click on that submit a question link at the top of the page. Or even better, you could call it in. Have I mentioned we need voicemail questions? So call 325-305-6107. Get yourself a $25 gift card to catconnection.com. Thank you to our show sponsors, Laid Muntins Mall, premium grains for a better brew day. If you aren't already brewing with Muntins, give them a try by joining the Trub Club at a recipe receiving level. For the best hops available online, give our friends at hopsdirect.com a visit and pick up what you need along, uh, pick up what you need for your next brew day. Also get a pack of premium imperial yeast along with premium recipes from us when you join the Trub Club again. Go to patreon.com forward slash homebrew happy hour and come brew with us. On behalf of Todd Burns, the absent James Carl, and the Pearl Media Network. I'm Joshua Stubing. Thanks for listening. <laughs>